Hey folks, today I've got my full in-depth review of the new Coros Apex 2 and Apex 2 Pro. Now Coros has released both these watches at the exact same time because they are almost exactly the same. In this review, I'm going to walk through what's new about these watches compared to the past, as well as how these watches differ from each other. From there, I'll go into how the watches are used day to day, everything from like daily activity tracking to sport tracking, mapping navigation. After that, we'll dive into the accuracy of the GPS and the heart rate, something that's notable because this has both new GPS and heart rate sensors. And then finally, I'll wrap up and talk about kind of where things are. You can use the YouTube chat as well on the bottom line there to skip ahead to the section you want more information about. With that, let's just dive straight into it. Now, first up, we'll talk about what's new compared to the past Apex series watches. Uh, and the big ticket item is on the Pro version, there is now multi van GPS. But both editions have what's called all system GPS. Now multiband, also known as dual frequency GPS, is considered generally speaking like the holy grail of GPS accuracy, but stay tuned for later in the video where I'll test whether or not that's actually true on these watches here. Now in addition to the new GPS chipset, they've also swapped out the optical heart rate sensor on the back here uh, for a more accurate optical heart rate sensor, and don't worry, we'll dive into that in just a moment as well. With that, there's the ability to take manual HRV readings, uh, so you can go ahead and do a manual HRV reading on the watch in the morning if you'd like to. It's not automatic behind the scenes like some other companies, but uh, you can do that manually. It takes about 60 seconds to complete that. Further with this new sensor, you also get blood oxygenation levels or SpO2 levels uh, that you can go ahead and have turned on to get those readings as you see fit. Next, they've added Wi-Fi connectivity. Uh, there isn't a lot used for Wi-Fi connectivity today except downloading firmware updates. That's something that's coming in the future. Uh, it's kind of what Coros promised for the Vertex 2 as well, but it sounds like that's closer range now than it was a year ago. Uh, hopefully in the mapping realm, downloading maps and things like that. But Wi-Fi is in here for future use once they kind of sort that out. Uh, they've also increased the storage. So the Apex 2 Pro has 32 gigs of storage, uh, and the Apex 2 base has 8 gigs of storage. In the past, the base unit had basically no storage. It had just a couple of megabytes for internal stuff, but not maps. Both units, though, now can download maps. In the case of the Pro, the global base maps are pre-downloaded onto the watch because it has so much more storage for the entire world to fit on its little watch there, uh, versus the base unit, you need to manually download those maps. You do have to use a computer for that. It's a little bit clunky, but again, that's something that Cora says they're aiming to change in the future by using the Wi-Fi, uh, but the timelines in that are a little bit fuzzy and how that's all gonna work out is also kind of fuzzy. But still, it's not that big a deal to download maps manually. Pretty straightforward. The next thing you'll notice is the Apex 2 base has the same button layout as the Pro. In the past, the base unit basically had one button plus a digital crown, but now they are the identical three buttons, including the digital crown. So this middle button right here is also a digital crown, of course, and a button, however you want to phrase that. They are the same externally uh, from a button and kind of layout and usability standpoint. Also, both of them do have touch screens, though it's a bit limited. Again, we'll talk about that in a second as well. Uh, and then finally, both of them include nylon straps like you see there. That is a standard included base option. You can still buy a silicone strap if you like, but uh, the nylon straps are there. And hey, just a quick note, if you are finding this video interesting and useful, and has a great time to whack that like button at the bottom there, it really does help with this video and the channel quite a bit. Okay, so how are these watches different then from each other, and how are they different to the Versix 2? Uh, and kind of the overarching theme according to Coros is that the Apex 2 series is essentially, especially the Apex 2 Pro, essentially just a mini Vertex 2, meaning a, a smaller package of this watch here, the Vertex 2, and you can see it's clearly smaller. So again, what are those core differences between the two models? Well, the base is $399 versus the Pro is $499. Uh, the Pro model has a multi-band or dual frequency GPS, whereas the base model just has all systems GPS, kind of a lower level, if you will. Uh, the Pro has a larger battery life. We'll talk about that in just a second. The Pro has 32 gigs of storage versus the base has has 8 gigs of storage. The Pro, as you can see, has a slightly larger screen, 1.3 inches versus 1.2 inches. And with that, it has slightly more pixels, so 260 pixels by 260 pixels versus 240 by 240, but keeping in mind that they're larger screens, so it all kind of works out like pixel math. They're effectively the same uh, when it comes to what you'd see on the screen. Uh, and then finally, the Pro has one additional sport mode, which is the multi-pitch activity. In any case, those are the two core differences from a battery life standpoint. Here is that battery chart right there. And then if we were to slide in that Vertex 2, I will take their fancy battery chart and add some annotations to it. Now, one of the things when you look at these battery charts to keep in mind is that Coros essentially trades, and you'll see this later on in the video, they're trading a little bit of that GPS accuracy for longer battery life. And that's sort of the general theme of how Coros gets such good battery life across the board. Okay, so let's talk about daily usage. Let's get this thing out of the way here. We got the two watches, and again, they are identical in almost every way except for the things I just noted, which is mostly internal spec things, right? With like the storage size, the battery life because of the size of the watch, of course, uh, and also the multi-band GPS. When it comes to usability, they're the same. Uh, so 
Starting off with, I'm just gonna put this off the side so I can do one watch at a time here. Uh, there's three buttons here. As you can see, one, two, three. This is the digital crown, allows you to unlock the watch as well. You can also just long press it like that to unlock. And then you can rotate the digital crown to go down through the widgets. These are all of your widgets, put this flat on the table there. These are all of your widgets and they have things like steps, for example, floors, etc. cetera. Uh, I find the steps is generally pretty accurate, but the floor is not so much. As you can see, it shows zero floors. Uh, I live in the Netherlands, so everything is tall, skinny, and steps. And I've already done many flights up and down the steps today, and so far it shows zero floors. Uh, I find it generally undercuts quite significantly in my floors, but frankly, I don't really track this too much. Uh, it's just not my cup of tea. But nonetheless, uh, if that really does matter to you, it's something to keep in mind. You'll see your trending load metrics right here. Uh, so you can see, for example, running performance. Uh, going down again, you can see here's my fatigue level. Uh, and going again, you can see my fatigue level over the last seven days, backing out again. Uh, you can see 19 hours until recovery uh, or nine hours until hard training. Below that, we've got heart rate. Uh, we've got my sleep tracking. And I'd say from a sleep tracking standpoint, the time I went to sleep and the time I woke up is been like spot on really, really close within like a minute or two in most cases. Uh, the sleep phases uh, and stages, if you will, haven't been super accurate. Like wearing these watches again side by side on the last uh, while here, uh, there are nights where I look at this and these two graphs are totally different. Uh, and of course that means the sleep stages are totally different. So I don't generally put much stock in any company's sleep stage or phase data. Uh, and this is no exception. Uh, scrolling on down here, you've got altitude, you've got your uh, sunset, sunrise, on down, you get more metrics you can add in there, uh, you got smartphone notifications, etc. Uh, now, to get into a sport mode, and by the way, these are identical across the board in all those respects. There's no differences there between these two uh, from a usability standpoint. Now, to get into sport mode, you go ahead and just tap this button once, and you can see all the sport modes. So run, trail run, etc. cetera. Uh, this mode right here, multi-pitch climb, is the only mode that is not on this watch. Every other sport mode, if I go through this list here, is on both watches equally. Now, once we've chosen a sport mode, we'll go ahead and get down to that run one, wherever that was. There we go. We can tap into it. Uh, and now you'll see the satellite at the top there, connectivity. Uh, you'll see my heart rate there, and then any sensors or accessories down there. In this case, the Coros pod. Uh, for almost all my runs, I did not use a pod, but I did for one, and I'll show you why in the accuracy section. Uh, you can do a basic interval. You can go into settings here. You can load up a course. Uh, so if we loaded up a course, for example, I've got all the different courses right there. Uh, you can have 10 courses loaded on the watch at once. Uh, so if I just tap open um, this simple one right here. Uh, once I've got this course started though, basically you're gonna have the map page that you can zoom in and out of. So if I just click start course, I can tap this button right here and I can zoom in and out. At this point, this is as far zoomed as it can go, the 25 meters there. So I can zoom out like this, it takes a couple seconds and I can also move the map around using my finger uh, with the touchscreen. And this is really the only portion of the touchscreen that works today. Uh, down the road, sometime November, December timeframe, Chorus will allow you to use a touchscreen in other parts of the watch, but not for confirmations. Meaning you'll be able to scroll through the widgets uh, and you'll be able to scroll through the sport mode list, but you'll still need the button there to confirm things. So it's like a sort of touchscreen, but it's fine. I don't tend to use the touchscreen for much, except the maps in this part here does work well. The challenge with navigation on all Coros watches, though, is that there's no turn-by-turn -turn notification. So as you're running along or cycling along, whatever it is may be doing, you will not get notification of an upcoming turn. You only get notified when you miss the turn and go off course, in which case you'll see this deviate course alert, uh, and you got to go back and figure out where you're going. So while it's nice that there's maps here, they're missing like the core fundamental part of navigation, which is to tell you when to navigate. And then while there is maps on here, it's not routable maps. I mean, think about like a transparency layer from a projector, for those of you that remember that from decades ago. Uh, there's maps and there's your route, but the two don't actually know each other exists. So it doesn't know that you're on this trail, it doesn't know you're on Main Street or Maple Street, it doesn't know that you're turning on to uh, Apple Street. They're all basically just, again, layers that don't have any interaction. So it cannot reroute you if you go off course because uh, it doesn't know where you actually are. It just knows that the course is that way, X amount of meters, and that you should go that general direction. Now, in terms of other data fields while you're running, you'll see all those as you've config configured right here. Uh, and I'm showing some screenshots out from a run. Uh, that includes things like running power as you're running along uh, and all kind of the standard different metrics that you would see. If you want to pair up to other sensors, you can do that. Off my ride a couple days ago, I paired to my power meter. It does support Bluetooth sensors, does not support AMP Plus though. Uh, and it supports kind of the core sensors you would expect. So cycling power, cycling cadence, cycling speed sensor, but it doesn't support any of the radar sensors or some of the advanced sort of things that you might see from more of the cycling realm. 
Now, once you're done with your workout, you'll see a summary on the watch. You can scroll through a bunch of different metrics there, or you can do the same thing on the Chorus app. It syncs to that. And if you've got apps like Strava or Training Peaks linked up, it'll send to that as well. Again, pretty much kind of standard issue stuff for most sports watches. Now, this would be a good time to dive into the accuracy. Before we do that, let's just briefly, very, very briefly talk about music. Uh, there is music storage on this, and you can go ahead and pair it to a pair of Bluetooth headphones, uh, but it's only supporting MP3 music. And I know there will be some people out there that will use and still like use MP3 and put them on the watches manually and all that kind of stuff. There is no streaming services on here. And as I've talked about in the past, I don't see that as likely for any of the major streaming services. They might, they, they're saying they're gonna try to sign a streaming service in 2023. Uh, my suspicion there, knowing that landscape pretty well, is it'll be a very small streaming service that you probably don't know of. Uh, it won't likely be the Spotify's or the Apple Music's or the whatever's the world because those like castle gardens have been, they've been fortified now. Those are locked in place and those aren't likely to change anytime soon. Uh, so if you do put mp3s on that, that's great. But if that's not your thing, then just keep that in mind from music standpoint. Now with that, let's dive into the accuracy. And I've got my computer here for that because we, we need to have a chat. So on all these tests here, I had basically both watches on my wrist at the same time. I had the Apex 2 Pro on one wrist and the Apex 2 on the other wrist. Uh, in cases where I'd like buildings and stuff like that were a concern, I actually went both ways down the street just to validate it wasn't like a body sort of thing. Uh, but what you'll see here is super interesting. Uh, so the very first test I did was kind of a, a standard issue run, some of it with like, you know, tree line pass, so easy stuff, uh, some tunnels and bridges, and then some deep city stuff. Uh, so for example, this first section here that you see, this is a relative relatively straightforward area. It does go under one bit of roadway, uh, but otherwise it's out mostly in the open. And, and you can see that the Apex 2 Pro is offset the side there in blue. Uh, the other ones aren't, you know, horribly rather off a few meters, but not quite as good as a 400 955, which is like spot on the GPS track. Another section here where I went over a canal and then under a bridge and back under over a canal again, uh, relatively straightforward minus the one little bridge I went under and it completely missed that and put me in the canal on both sides incorrectly. Uh, and so that wasn't super ideal. I then did my city test that I've been doing on all my GPS watches and you know, it wasn't horrible, but it wasn't like multi-band great, especially for the Apex 2 Pro that does have multi-band on it. Uh, you can see here, looking at these tracks, that it's just offset a bit. Uh, and now, certainly the Garmin 955 is also offset in some areas, but on the whole, the Apex watches are more offset than that one. Though not as offset as the Suunto 5 Peak Pro, uh, which was offset the most. Uh, but you can see another section up here at the top where it has me like in the lake and the water, that's not super awesome. And then just generally missing turns kind of left and right and offset a fair bit. So I went back to Chorus and said, yo, what's up with your, your new fancy GPS? Because I talked about a new antenna design in this and all this kind of fun stuff. Uh, and I said, well, take the Chorus pod, pair it to it and see if you get better GPS accuracy with that. The Chorus Pod does not have GPS in it, but it does have a compass and a gyro and an altimeter, all those kind of sensors inside of it that is then used in conjunction with this to go ahead and make it all work better. So I went out and did that, and at first it looked like it might be working. Uh, I did like a crossing the street that you can see right there, and it nailed that really, really close with the watch that was paired to it, which is the Apex 2 Pro. Uh, but the Apex 2 was off on the other side of the street along with the Vertex 2 in the wrong spots. Uh, but then once I got up into the buildings, it wasn't super awesome. And again, made actually more mistakes with that than the one without the pod did. Uh, it had like these weird offsets throughout the entire course. And I uh, to me, like you shouldn't have to pay another hundred bucks for a pod to fix the GPS inaccuracy. In this case, the pod still made it worse anyway. So um, I'm still not on team pod yet there at this point, at least for that. On the bright side though, it did have the correct distance. So the distance for the uh, pod based unit was matching the 955 versus the Vertex 2 and the non-pod based uh, Apex 2 base unit uh, were off by roughly 250 meters on just a 5k run which is a lot by the way um, so at least the pod fixed the distance side of it now on those two runs let's briefly look at heart rate uh, on the first run i did it was steady state but every two kilometers i did these hard intervals uh, and kudos to Coros, they absolutely nailed the heart rate tracking on that no if ands or buts well i guess one one minor interval at the very very end uh it missed slightly on one of the two apex two watches but otherwise like really solid across the board for these intervals uh, and then the second run i did it sort of missed the boat entirely on the ramp up part of it. Uh, it ramped up way too fast. It basically did cadence lock, which means that it locks on your cadence and not your heart rate. And then a couple minutes later, a stoplight, uh, it like lost the plot entirely for a few minutes. Now looking at the indoor workout from a heart rate standpoint, uh, this hard interval workout on an indoor trainer uh, absolutely nailed it. Perfect across the board, so kudos there. Uh, then I went outside to the same thing on an outdoor ride, and it was good until it wasn't. And once it lost the plot, you can see in purple right there, 
it lost it hard for like five minutes at a time, and then again later on for three minutes at a time. And now outdoor cycling isn't something I typically judge too many watches on. It's usually a dumpster fire, uh, and this is like a it's like a small waste basket fire. It's not really horrible, but it's it's not ideal because it just lost it for so long. Now the good side is on the GPS tracks for that outdoor ride, it was spot on across the board. Like you can look at these down below here; they're they're perfect. Though this was pretty easy. It was one section in the trees, but overall it's pretty good. Now the last area we look at is GPS accuracy in open water swims. Uh, in this case, it started off good, and then I did my treading water test. And if you're an open water swimmer, you know that there are many reasons you would stop to tread water for a second. It could be swimming with a buddy, it could be fixing your goggles, it could be going around a race buoy pack with people uh, in a mass star triathlon. Uh, and in all those cases, you should be able to tread water and not have GPS like lose the plot entirely. Unfortunately, it did lose the plot here on both watches at the exact same time in opposite directions, which was kind of interesting. Uh, uh, and then after that, uh, the Apex 2 base unit was offset for the remainder of the swim. Uh, so that's not a deal. Uh, so overall, if I looked at my GPS accuracy across all my activities, I'd say accuracy is goodish. Uh, it's not multi-band good. It's not anywhere near the same performance level as multi-band watches from other companies at the same or lower price points. It's just equivalent to what I would typically have seen on a non-multi-band configuration. And of course, in the case of the Apex 2 Base, it doesn't have multi-band. In the case of the Apex 2 Pro, it does have multi-band. And obviously, I had that enabled the entire time. In fact, the very first time you turn it on for a sport profile, it asks you if you want to turn that on. And now, that ultimately gets us to kind of like the summary, the wrap-up, if you will, and where these things stand. Uh, and Ultimately, the Apex 2 watches are good watches. Uh, they largely do all the fundamentals pretty well, and they'll easily track your workouts across the board. I had no issues with like the fundamental bits of it. Uh, the accuracy, as you saw, was good, but not great. Uh, and thus, they aren't the most accurate watches for the money today, nor are they most full-featured watches. And I know tech reviewers on YouTube often like to sidestep the entire price thing when things get kind of uncomfortable, but the reality is that price is a fundamental part of buying a product. And now, as I've said before, Chorus is most deadly when they undercut the competition on price. Take, for example, the Coros Pace 2 at $199. That is an incredible watch for that price point. Uh, full feature triathlon watch, sensor connectivity, all this goodness at a price well below all of their competitors, and you know, generally very solid accuracy. Uh, where they get in trouble is when they try to be at the same price as their competitors without having all those features or the same levels of accuracy. And that's kind of what's going on right here. If we look at something like the Apex 2 Pro, that's at $499. But so is the Garmin 400 955, also at $499. And there's absolutely nobody out there that would say that the Apex 2 Pro has anywhere near the same levels of features or accuracy or anything at all compared to the 955. Now, if we drop it down to the uh, Apex 2 base unit, this unit here is at $399, which is in the same price ballpark as something like the Garmin 400 255, which flips between $349 and $399, depending on music, or the Instinct 2 series at $400. Now, Coros advantage is they do have maps at that price point, uh, which is something that Garmin does not at that price point. Point. On the flip side, Garmin has more music support, more other features, uh, and way more navigation support at that price point, meaning that while they don't have maps, the navigation does have turn-by-turn -turn navigation and other features like that. So it's a bit squishy there. And so at that point, I kind of went back to Chorus and said, why do you have two watch models at different price points here? Why not just consolidate into one? And they kind of gave two reasons. One, they said that they wanted to have a model for women's wrists, or basically smaller wrists, and that was the Apex 2 base. And two, they thought that the base model, there was nothing that was really competitive with them at that price point. Uh, now, I would disagree on that second piece there. But I do agree on the idea of having two different sizes, like most of their competitors do. But I would have thought they could have been, again, their most deadly by being at $399 for both of these watches with multi-band, the larger uh, storage, you know, preload of maps. Uh, at that point, then it becomes a really interesting conversation. But the way the pricing is today relative to the features included in each model, that's a bit of a tougher conversation. Uh, still, I'm looking forward to seeing what cores can do with this down the road, especially around that mapping realm. Uh, if they can go ahead and really up their game on the mapping side, then that makes the value prop of both these watches more interesting, but especially this base watch. So in summary, it's a good watch. It generally works pretty well. Uh, it just needs a little bit of a price adjustment relative to what it has in the box today. Anyways, hopefully you found this interesting and useful. If so, go ahead and like that like button at the bottom there. There is plenty more sports technology goodness coming along the way. It's still going to be a very busy November, so uh, stay tuned for all that by hitting the subscribe button there as well. With that, have a good one.